These days it seems like there's no depths that Disney won't sink to in their relentless pursuit of profit over artistic merit, and truly there's no better example of this creative abyss than their endless live action remakes of their most popular animated movies, basically the entertainment equivalent of the pod people from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Superficially they might resemble the friends and family you once trusted and cared for, and even emulate some of their mannerisms and behaviours, but behind the pleasing facade there's something very different. The vital spark, the individuality, the very soul that made them who they were has been brutally erased, leaving behind an empty, emotionless husk of what they once were. Which brings me neatly along to The Little Mermaid, a film dogged by controversy and backlash, saddled with sky-high expectations, and of course, reimagined for modern audiences. It's a film that everyone seems to have an opinion about, and whose success or failure could mark a sea change in the landscape of modern cinema. But can it really hope to keep its head above water, or will it be dashed on the rocks of failure? <laughs> The Little Mermaid is basically a case study in why live-action remakes of beloved animated movies are a fucking terrible idea. It's slow-paced, bloated with nearly an hour of unnecessary padding, filled with dog shit CGI that looks like it was rendered on a PlayStation 3, populated with veteran actors that look embarrassed just to be in it, or bad actors that look excited to be in anything, a soundtrack that's an uncomfortable mix of tired rehashes of classic songs and gratingly awful new ones, and of course awkward reworking of iconic moments to make sure the film adheres to THE MESSAGE. In short, The Little Mermaid is just another shitty, soulless, pointless Disney remake whose only real accomplishment will probably be an upsurge in support for the original animated movie. Anyway, what the hell, give me a ship and 50 stout men because we're sailing into dark waters with this one. Now, normally this is where I'd give you a detailed plot breakdown, but that would be kind of a waste of time in this case because if you've seen the 1989 animated movie then you've basically seen this one too. It's pretty much a beat for beat remake of it. Halle Bailey plays Ariel, the wayward teenage daughter of King Triton, who's fascinated by the world above the waves and longs to explore it. And when Eric, the young prince of an island kingdom, almost drowns in a shipwreck, she defies her father's warnings and saves his life. Her desire to be part of Eric's world eventually brings her to the sea witch, Ursula, who offers to turn her into a human being in exchange for her voice. Many wacky shenanigans ensue and Ursula eventually betrays Ariel and turns into a giant sea monster that has to be defeated so that Ariel and Eric can live happily ever after. So if it's the same exact story as before, then what's the problem, you might ask? Well, the first issue has got to be the length. The 89 version clocked in at just 83 minutes, without ever feeling rushed or jarring, which is fucking impressive considering how much it manages to cram in plot-wise. This one, on the other hand, drags on for 135 minutes. That's almost an hour more, and Jesus Christ, you really start to feel that extra length after a while. Just like Tatiana. <laughs> like a say, it's not as if the script adds anything substantial to justify the extra runtime either. Everything's just slower and clunkier than it was before. Conversations drag on longer than they need to, transitions and action scenes are flaccid and bloated, and minor characters that are supposed to be there for comic relief get way too much screen time. Even the dialogue feels like it was written with absolutely no understanding of what happened in the previous scene. Like at one point Ariel retreats into her grotto after an argument with her father, and when Sebastian tracks her down there, she literally asks him, how did you find me? Oh, I don't know, Ariel. Maybe it's because you come here every fucking day of your life. You don't exactly have to be Hercule Poirot to work this one out. All of this stuff adds up to a sense of crushing and frustrating inertia. I was bored out of my arse and scrolling through my phone after the first 30 minutes, and that was with a bottle of fine whiskey to keep me amused too. God only knows how little kids raised on TikTok videos and high fructose corn syrup are supposed to sit in a crowded movie theatre and watch this shit. The second issue is the visuals. There's no easy way of saying this, this movie looks like dog shit. I've coughed up things that are more aesthetically pleasing than this movie. The vibrant and colourful underwater world of the animated film has become a dark, dreary, badly rendered hellscape here, and the occasional flashes of garish colour only serve to emphasise how fucking gloomy and depressing the rest of it is. The CGI is also some of the worst I've seen in any mainstream movie ever. Well, almost. All the mermaids move with 
with this weird, jerky, unnatural motion. The fluidity and the graceful elegance of the animated film is nothing but a distant memory here. This looks exactly like what it is. A bunch of actors in mocap suits getting pulled around a giant green room. How did this cost 200 million dollars? It's the same deal with the animal characters. Remember Flounder, Sebastian and Scuttle from the 89 movie? Remember how expressive and charming they were because the animators didn't have to worry about rendering photorealistic animals with human behaviour? Well, forget about that because now we've got Sebastian who looks just like an actual crab. Or Flounder who's literally a fish that talks. And as for Scuttle, played by Aquafina... Then. Are you listening to me? Yes, uh... Uh, 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 uh. Tell me, who exactly thought it would be a good idea to cast an actress with the voice of a 70 year old chain smoker in a role like this? Listening to her sing is the audio equivalent of having my ears raped by a dildo made out of broken glass. Remember my song in the swamp when I was like, wham, chicka, wham, wham, chicka, wham. <laughs> issue is the performances. Let's be honest, Halle Bailey was always going to be a controversial choice for Ariel, and I can't shake the feeling it was done to send a message or tick a box rather than make a faithful adaptation of the source material, but whatever. I mean, you can tell that she's a professional singer because she nails all the musical numbers flawlessly, but as for her acting skills... Well, she seems happy to be there at least. Prince Eric fits neatly into the mould of soft, meek, placid, ineffectual and easily dominated modern Disney leading men, carefully constructed so as not to offend or threaten anyone in a MODERN AUDIENCE. He's written without an ounce of agency, charisma or self-confidence and portrayed exactly the same way by an actor with all the magnetism and screen presence of Warwick Davis in the Willow TV show. Can't have those pesky men getting ideas above their stations, eh? Also, I've got to say that the unspecified island kingdom he belongs to is the kind of place that could only possibly spring from the mind of a modern Hollywood writer. Like, the general landscape and climate seem to suggest a vaguely Caribbean location, but most of the people who actually live there are white. The clothing, culture and general technology levels are roughly in line with 18th century Europe, but the queen of the island and Eric's mother is black and the prime minister is Pakistani. What the fuck even is this place? I love how no matter what his historical era or location it's meant to be set in, every Disney movie seems to be more diverse than downtown Los Angeles. It's also nice to know that the film carefully obeys the golden rule of modern writing that no woman can ever possibly get rescued by a man. Like remember in the finale of the 89 movie how Prince Eric bravely took control of the damaged ship and steered the prow right into Ursula's chest just as she was about to kill Ariel, saving her life just like she saved his earlier? Well, those outdated ideas of heroic self-sacrifice have got no place in modern Disney movies where women are all portrayed as unstoppable, all-conquering badasses and men just need to step aside and make way for them. So naturally Ariel takes control of the ship and saves the day instead, despite having absolutely no experience or understanding of sailing ships or how they function. Well that's definitely shite. <laughs> None of that matters though, because this strong, independent young woman doesn't need some clumsy man to help her. She can jolly well save herself, damn it. You know, I would genuinely love to know what these people think romance is supposed to look like in current year, because movies like this are actively killing the very concept of it. Weirdly, the best aspect of this film for me was Melissa McCarthy as Ursula, who's just as devious, manipulative and delightfully malicious as she was in the original. She's evil and she fucking loves it. And when Melissa McCarthy is the best thing in your movie, you know you've got fucking problems. All of these issues add up to a depressingly pointless, cynically soulless kind of movie that's really just a longer, less colourful and less entertaining rehash of the very thing it's trying so hard to milk for nostalgia. A film that fails to be either good or original, because the things it does that are halfway good aren't original and the rare moments of originality aren't good. And despite all the controversies and debates around race and representation, The Little Mermaid's biggest problem is that, well, it's just a bit shit. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.